Good afternoon. Welcome to I Nicole's April Leadership Webinar. My clock says 1 p.m. Eastern Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ashley Jones. I'm the Program Manager at I Nicole and the Project Manager at Competency Works. So I'm so glad to open today's webinar, but um, before we turn it over um, to my presenters, I want to just give a couple housekeeping items to go through. At the bottom left-hand corner, you will see a chat box. If you could, as Chris mentioned earlier, to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what you're hoping to learn. Um, we want this to be a lively and engaging conversation today, and um, we encourage you guys to use the chat, chat box to do so. We will be pausing throughout the webinar and also at the end to post questions to you guys. So if you could use the chat box to ask any questions and we will do our best to monitor and make sure that we get those started for you guys. Um, you can share what you're learning on Twitter using the hashtag CompetencyEd and be sure to connect with us with Maycall and CompetencyWorks. Um, this way we can extend the learning beyond this webinar and share our insights with our networks, peers, and learning communities. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the iNicole and Competency Works websites. We'll send you a follow-up email within the next few days with the link and we'll, uh, you'll be able to download the slides as well as review the entire webinar recording and revisit discussions or refer back to something you may have missed or share with your colleagues and peers if you do choose to do so. If you have any audio issues, you can let me know, which is the iNicole administrator or also Natalie Abel through the chat box and we'll try to get that handled for you guys. And you can also run the audio setup wizard, which is um, if you check the toolbox, you scroll down in your toolbox, it should be there for you guys for the setup wizard. Um, we are grateful to have Chris Sturgis, who is the principal of MedisNet and our co-founder of Competency Works, and Carla Phillips excuse me, Carla Phillips of Excellent here with us today to explore communication strategies for shifting towards personalized competency-based education. And with that, I will now turn it over to Chris. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. I can hear Good. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so I was babbling. Let me go back here and just say that I have heard Carla's presentation. This will be my third time. And this is some of the most outstanding work that anybody has done in eight years of competency-based education. So we're just in for a treat. Um, but what I want to do, just for all the newbies, um, is just talk about what competency-based education is and isn't uh, before we get started. So in 2011, uh, we brought together 100 practitioners, innovators, policymakers who were all um, basically leading the way in competency-based education. And quite honestly, they were working in pockets of isolation, pockets of innovation, but they hadn't ever had the chance to come together. And at that meeting, what we developed are five elements of uh, competency-based ed. And the reason was that New Hampshire was using the phrase competency, Maine was using proficiency, some, uh, Connecticut was using mastery, and some districts used performance-based. And there was no way we were going to get everybody to agree on the same terms. And at the time, the federal government was using the term competency-based education. They have since shifted. So that was why we thought having five elements of a working definition would help build the field together. And these five elements were students advance upon demonstrated mastery. Now, a lot of people interpret this as flexible pace or even self-pace. 
And that really is not the core idea. The core idea is A, all those students who have gaps, get those gaps repaired in their knowledge, or if they happen to be at a lower grade level in their skill set than their age, that we really work to make sure that they're learning everything they fully need. They're actually reaching mastery on all the prerequisite skills they're going to need for advanced. And the other side of that is that the students really who know everything at grade level get to advance beyond their grade level. That's really the core idea. So it's an equity idea and it's having kids reach their potential idea. Competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that empower students. And the core ideas here is really the transparency and how much that it changes the dynamics and the power dynamics of schools where students really can ha have much more responsibility. They, they build student agency and own their education when they really know what they're supposed to learn, what it looks like to be proficient, and can access supports. As assessment is meaningful and a positive learning experience for students. And this is really trying to return assessment back into the cycle of learning instead of thinking of it as part of the accountability system. And what we want to see happen there is that students really get much more formative feedback. They understand why they didn't understand something. They get new, more instruction. They get opportunities to um, revise their work until they reach proficiency. So that's really about making a positive, um, positive experience. Students receive timely differentiated support based on their individual learning needs. This is really common sense, but a lot of schools don't offer it. Basically, what we're seeing is schools develop flex hour in their schedule so kids can get help every day when they need it. And then the learning outcomes emphasize competencies that include application and creation of knowledge or higher order skills, along with the development of important skills and dispositions. And this is really descri describing the new definitions of success, of academic knowledge, transferable skills, and making sure kids have the building blocks for learning, metacognition, self-regulation, social emotional skills uh, to become lifelong learners. So that's what we think about when we think about competency education. We think of it as a school or district-wide strategy. Uh, and I think that's it. If you have any questions about that for any newbies, I will answer them in the chat room, but I don't want to hold this um, up. So I'm now turning this over to Carla. Um, take it away. Thanks, Chris. Good morning. Uh, let me know if you guys can't hear me. Uh, my name is Carla Phillips. I'm the Policy Director for Personalized Learning with Foundation for Excellence in Education, otherwise known as Excel in Ed. And I am excited always to work with INACOM Competency Works on furthering this work across the country. Should you go to the next slide? Oh, I'm forwarding it. Let's see. So we noticed a couple big trends I'm sure all of you noticed as well, is that one, nationally, there's been a big shift in terminology. The folks are leaning more towards that broader umbrella term of personalized learning rather than CBE in general. But also, and excitedly, we notice huge, huge increase in interest and in implementation of both of them at the state and local levels. So we've been advocating for pilot programs and innovation zones for the past couple of years and working with states to help implement them along with KnowledgeWorks and, um, and INACOL. And from these states and these schools, we've learned a lot of lessons. But honestly, the biggest one we've learned has been the difficulty and the importance of strategic communication and outreach strategies. So as a result, we conducted some message testing. But before I get into the details of that, I want to talk to you about how we structured this. And one of them is this is really about the elevator pitch, or from a policymaker perspective, what I would call our one pager. That one pager we would hand a policymaker, or that elevator pitch that you're going to give someone, or that first outreach meeting you're going to have with your staff or your parents or your school board. So this is about making that, what I call sometimes that opening salvo. So we conducted a digital landscape analysis and message testing with 800 voters nationally. We basically uh, teased out some of the key arguments for personalized learning and, saw, and tried to see how they were responded to. So what we learned really quickly is that there's a lot of really important nuances that hopefully you'll learn from today as well. So interestingly enough, when we did the digital media landscape, we basically, our, our consultants, surveyed the, the internet for all of these terms that we discussed. And then in this context, we also saw competency, proficiency, and mastery-based as interchangeable and looked for all of them. 
Um, what we found really quickly is that competency-based education in general is kind of a niche topic. It was much more closely associated with higher ed, and you know, it, it trended heavy when there was a conference that was related to it. And we saw that personalized learning is much more widely used in social media than any of the other ones. And let me just also say at the outset, a lot of this stuff is not going to be shocking to you, but I think it's really important to reflect on, which I'm hoping we can do today. So one of the things that we also did was we asked a very specific question. We asked voters, if a student is said to have demonstrated mastery in Algebra 1, do you think they're ready for the next, for the next level? But then we also asked half the voters if students demonstrated competency in Algebra 1, if they thought they'd be ready. Voters were overwhelmingly more confident with the term mastery over competency, which I know this can be kind of scandalous since that competency works as our host. But generally speaking, I want you all to know we know that competency is used in certain states and statutes for very specific reasons, sometimes political, sometimes just evolutionary. So we are not necessarily advocating that everybody go out and amend their statutes. If, you know, if they feel the need to, we're more than willing to help with that and give talking points. But generally, this is also about how you would explain it. Again, that, that brochure you're going to give the parents, that one page you're going to give a policymaker of what this initiative generally means. And we would advise to lean more heavily on the term mastery. We asked voters if they had heard the phrase personalized learning. And most have, but the only time I'm going to point out demographics is when they were really significant. And this is an example of one. So 68% of Hispanic voters and 59% of voters with only a high school diploma had not heard of personalized learning. So that's a really significant difference depending on the community you're working with or you live in. The best news of all was uh, our hopes were affirmed. Personalized learning is indeed intuitive. So we asked voters what they thought it was. We have over 400 open-ended responses to this question, which um, I often joke I'm still delving through. But the cool part was all of them had a very similar theme, just different verbs. So there, it's catered. It's customized. It's adjusted to. It's personalized. They get it. They understand on its face what personalized learning should be about. And it was generally well received. So this is an important nuance. So when we asked them where students, the definition was where students advance to higher levels of learning when they personally demonstrate mastery regardless of time, place, or pace. That's the question. You can see it on the screen. And I'm going to go through slides quickly, so please come back to these and read them more in depth. But I want to point this out because for those of you who have been doing this for a while, you realize that that's really the definition of competency-based education. And we did that intentionally. Um, especially knowing that our, our feelings were affirmed. That generally, personalized learning is intuitive. People get it. But we think this is the hardest part, that mastery-based progression for folks to understand and certainly to implement at the ground level. And we were very pleasantly surprised at how well this tested. So if you look, 80% of voters thought this was a good idea. That was phenomenal news and honestly really surprised me. Any questions so far? I know I just covered some really big concepts. One, voters' general reception of the idea of competency-based education, but also their preference to the term mastery. Any comments, questions, or concerns? There haven't been any questions in the chat room yet. Folks, just leave a question, and we'll just lift them up. But does anybody have any questions now? You can toggle on your talk button if you do. Um, and also, just make sure we do share the um, webinar video so you will be able to see all of this again and see the slides. Um, here's a question, Carla. Is there a difference between what they think generically and what they might answer they want for their own children in school? The question, if I remember correctly, was specifically about whether or not this would interest them more to have personalized learning in their school. So it was the, the questions were very specifically geared to whether they would be interested in this in their community and in their schools. Great. Great. OK. Why don't we move on? All right. So let's get to the, let's get to the meat. So we asked a series of questions describing the benefits of personalized learning and how it works. For each of those questions, we asked them if they were much more interested, and if you notice, interested in the schools in their area implementing personalized learning, somewhat more, neither more, somewhat less, or much less. 
But here's where it got juicy. We also asked them to choose or click on the words or phrases that stood out to them as particularly important to why it made them more or less interested. This is where it got good. So quick observations before we delve in is they were able to choose more than one word or phrase, but you'll see very clearly from the data that there were certain ones that definitely jumped out to voters. And what, just as a, also an observation, um, kind of cutting to the end a little bit, judging from the, the open-ended questions that we asked, it's very obvious to us that there were certain words and phrases that maybe didn't make them opposed to or more excited about, but they just generally are trying to wrestle with what that means, which those of you in the field know the kind of questions that come really quickly is, what does this look like? What does this mean? So we um, gave them instruction will be tailored to a student's strengths and interests to keep them more engaged in their learning. Now here's a spoiler alert. All nine sentences or phrases tested really well. So all nine of them got at least, I think, 67% or more of voters more interested in personalized learning. But I'm going to go through them in highest rankings. So this was 76% more interested. But if you look at the data, it's interesting to see the words or phrases that made people more interested, tailored to, strengths and interests, and engaged, which is really great news. But if you look at the will be tailored, these are the ones that got, I call them double dipped. So they're both green and red. And these are the ones that you'll see in the next nine slides. These are the ones that I think, if you, again, if we're in the field, those of us who are out there talking to folks, you know these are the phrases that it sounds nice, but people are really struggling with what that means, what would it look like in the classroom, and they can't quite understand it. Next, students' progress in school will be evaluated based on knowledge and skills they can demonstrate successfully rather than the seat time they've spent as a student. Knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills. That is the number one missing, uh, winning message you're going to see today. No matter how we phrased it, they liked the term knowledge and skills. Just look at how, how bad seat time tested, which again, in retrospect, that shouldn't be too surprising. It's pretty much an inside baseball or what I would call a wonky term, and there's certainly better ways to describe the amount of time students spent in school or class rather than using that phrase. So I'm trying not to do it myself. But overall, you can see generally how well this tested. Next, diplomas will truly represent that a graduate is prepared with the knowledge and skills to succeed after graduation, giving employers confidence. Again, great news. Look at how well is prepared with the knowledge and skills to succeed tested. But look at will truly represent. Again, this is an example of one where I don't think that term necessarily made people more opposed or more supportive. I think it's that phrase, that, what does that mean? And you're going to hear me say that over and over again. And again, I think we all get this in the field all the time, is what would that look like? What does it mean to truly represent? Students will move to new concepts and skills when they demonstrate mastery of the skills that need to come before it. Demonstrate mastery of the skills, again, tested really well. The new concepts, all of this, this sentence that generally tested really well. The highest read, of course, is when they demonstrate. But again, my assumption, uh, again, based on all the open-ended responses that we got that we're going to talk about in a second, is really because they just don't understand what that means. Students can learn at a flexible pace that's right for them in order to ensure they have fairly learned the material. I have a full confession. I never use the term at their own pace and strike it anytime I see it, mainly because I think it leads people to um, fall right into the common myth. So this is just students kind of doing their own thing. They're in front of a computer. There's no teacher. How does that work? So I have always try to use the term flexible pace, but clearly I still need to work on that as well because look at how how high green and red flexible pace was. But again, my Theory is that they're just trying to figure out what that means and what will it look like. I and mean, all of us know that we all grew up in traditional schools. Our kids, for the most part, are in traditional schools. Um, so they just can't figure out what that would be. Teachers will have tools to meet each student where they are in the learning process. This sentence is really funny to me because the phrase we were really trying to get at is meet students where they are. I know I use that term all the time. I see it in all of our documents all the time. But look at the phrase that stood out. It was really that we'll have tools. Uh, so it's really something we need to emphasize is that they will have the tools and the flexibility they need 
to meet each student. And look at that each student too, also equally green and red. Um, I think that, what does that mean? Schools may change classroom design, school schedules, and use new technology tools to give teachers more flexibility to help all students. I giggle because this is one of my favorite sentences because full confession, I had this sentence in probably all of my one pages and have since stricken it. So look at that data, but it's really not too surprising if you think about it. Why, I don't even know why I thought in a one pager in my opening salvo it would be a good idea to tell someone, hey, if you do personalized learning, everything you really know about school is going to go out the window. Probably not the wisest choice, so I have kind of stricken all that sentence out of my, my one pagers. Uh, because as, as those of you in the field know, schools that are implementing this, these things may change, but they're not going to change in the first year, maybe not in the first couple of years. And again, in your one page or your first meeting with parents or school board, this is not how you would want to start out, that you're throwing everything out the window. But the good news is really look how high technology tested. That one surprised me. I thought that would be a lot higher in the red, but more flexibility. So flexibility is another term that I've always used a lot. I overemphasize now, given what we've seen from this data. Here's another perfect sentence that I had that I've also stricken out of all of my documents since. Student grades will be based on their mastery of content and skills rather than things like attendance, participation, and extra credit, which don't necessarily reflect mastery. I always thought that made a lot of sense, but you know, think of thinking about it. We know that nobody really likes change, so I don't know why I thought that would be good. And plus, these are what I call iconic parts of school, right? Attendance, participation, and extra credit. And again, we know that in a perfect CBE or mastery-based world, these things will maybe go to the wayside, but they're not going to happen immediately, and it's not something you want to open with. The good news, though, is look at the front half of that sentence. Students will be based, student grades will be based on their mastery of content skills. So that part still is resonating really strongly. And you know, part of my theory is that people, as I think some of you would agree, at least most of you, think that that's what grades are based on now until they're really pushed to think about it, right? Which is that second half of the sentence. But they may not be ready to throw all that out the window again at that first meeting. So we also, when we did that digital media analysis, our consultants found what they found to be, and this is hard to say because it's kind of a double negative, the most successful negative messages that were on the internet. So the good news is the opposition to personalized learning and competency-based education is still fringe. Um, it's growing stronger in some states, which we can talk about later if you want, kind of tied more to the Tea Party anti-common core movements. Um, but on those web pages, we found their most successful negative messages. So we tested those five as well, doing the same thing. We asked them if this, these sentences made voters more or less interested in personalized learning and also ask them to click on those words and phrases that made them more or less interested. So here's three of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pause for a second so you can glance at them. But look at the phrases that stood out. Not a big shocker, right? Standardized testing, teachers being overworked. But the reason I think it's important for us to think about these for a second is I don't think that any of you would put out a one page that says, we're going to increase standardized testing and do personalized learning. I don't think we would. I think some of these are pitfalls we may inadvertently uh, fall into. So in other words, if we use sentences, and I've seen them before, we all have, um, students will be free, more frequently assessed to determine mastery and see if they're ready to progress. Even sentences like that that sound more innocuous can just all it sounds to a voter is more testing. Because so remember, the average voter, and by that I mean you know, policymakers, parents, uh, school board members, don't always distinguish between formative and summative and benchmark. They just hear more testing. So I think it's, it's an important thing to reflect upon. On the lesson we're acting, you're going to see how we have modified our definition. And we just proactively say one of the goals of personalized learning is to increase substantive interaction with teachers and peers. And teachers being overworked. I think it's also important that when you think about those meetings that you're going to have with parents, and, and again, even more with staff and school board members, how do you describe the future this works with doesn't sound like that. I mean, it may be. I mean, we're not going to be shy. I mean, teachers are going to change. Things will change, but you don't want to scare people away. 
Here are two more negative messages. And the last one is the one I want to think about for a second because honestly, I think the last one is the one that we fall into more often than not and completely unintentionally. Even though most of us on this call have already bought into the idea of personalized competency mastery-based learning, we have to remember um, that, especially if you're new to the subject, it doesn't sound possible. You can't envision it. So you may think that the only way you're going to get students to progress in a timely fashion is to lower the bar. So again, think about how you're framing it and how you're framing that brochure, that one pager, so it doesn't sound like that's it. Or you proactively address it and say, you know, we will continue to have high expectations. We will continue to do this and being and just addressing it at the outset. So this is kind of the way we're framing it now. If you can see from this graphic, you'll see that mastery-based education is really for us that foundation for personalized learning. Because as Chris described, and we wholeheartedly agree, we think mastery-based progressions is the way to ensure equity and rigor in a personalized learning system. If you look at, and I don't even want to call it a definition, kind of the way we're framing personalized learning, I want to tease out the last sentence in that first bullet point. Notice how we're saying students are encouraged to play a greater role and be more invested in their learning. That's because we've seen from other studies as well as ours that voters are not always that excited about the idea of a sentence that says, students will own their own learning. As I've often joked as a parent, I would say, why? I mean, they live in a dictator shape in my house. And I say that jokingly. But think about it from a mom perspective, um, especially depending on the age of the students. As I've often known to joke publicly, please don't tell my son, that you know, I remind people of how many times he forgets his lunchbox, his homework, I have to drive to school. So the idea of him owning his own learning is a little bit frightening. But one of the things that I would advise, and again, this is based not just on our study, but others we've seen in focus groups from some of our partners as well, we, I think we all agree that the goals of personalized learning is for students to take greater ownership, to be self-empowered, all those things are goals. But sometimes we inadvertently describe them as prerequisites to participate in the personalized learning program, which is why we've often seen from other studies that the, one of the frequent myths is this is just for those kids. This program would be great for the gifted kids, but not all kids. So that's why I would really caution you to be careful of how you message things as goals or expected outcomes, because I think every parent wants their student to graduate with those skills, leave school with those skills but not message it as a prerequisite or something like you have to have those skills in order to participate in personalized learning. Um, and I, I'm going to go back to a slide if I can, if you would allow me for a second. Um, look at have input. Look at how 80% neg read on that one. And that's the kind of data I'm talking about. We've seen this in other studies and other focus groups. Um, so again, I think there's a difference between messaging them having that power, but increasing their engagement. Because we also know that engagement tested really well, right? So if you go back to my new uh, definition, you'll see that what I'm saying is students are encouraged to play a greater role and be more invested in their learning. That was a whole lot of data out of the fire hose for you. Any thoughts, questions, things you want to throw out? And um, those stories? Yeah, we have three questions. Let me do them in order. Um, the first one is, uh, and this is a question I have myself listening to you. How do we handle the question, that the follow-up question of what would it look like? For the people who don't quite understand you know, how this would all look like in a classroom, this may not be your opener, but it's your follow-up question. So how would you answer that question, Carla, based on your research? Well, what does it all look like? Yeah, I'm going to, let me, hold on, let me look at the slides. We're going to talk about that if you want to hold that one for one second at the end. Can we hold that one for one second? But that's a huge one. Yes, you can. can. We'll get to it. Okay. Um, second question was, and I'm assuming this is coming from one of the states where the policy is that all the, all the districts will become competency-based or personalized. How do we message that this is about learning and not compliance? So if you were in Maine right now, with everything going on in Maine, how would you talk about this in a way that would navigate the world of state policy and compliance? 
I think compliance makes sense to us, but again, this is intentionally thinking about policymakers, parents, families who are not as inside on this. So I think it's that goal, so those outcomes of how we want students to graduate. There was an awesome op-ed from a guy from, I think, the Maine Chamber of Commerce that I would encourage you all to see, and Chris, I'm happy to forward it if you didn't see it just this week, that really talked about this is important because this is how we need students, this is what we need out of our graduates. So that's a much more compelling message because compliance, again, I often joke as a mom, I'm like, I'm not, I don't have a problem with compliance. I want my kids to be kind of compliant, right? Um, so that, that, they don't know what that means. We, we interpret compliance as those things that students get grades on. When people hear compliance, they think behavior disciplines. I don't think that term works at all to the broad public. Okay. Um, and then, uh, oh, wait a minute. So we had a clarification of the question. The question I was thinking about is how we get teachers to look at mastery rather than compliance with attendance and participation. We are also a virtual school having to comply with the brick and mortar attendance law. Um, I'm looking, so we are going to talk a little bit about some great talking points for teachers. Can we hold that one for a second too? Yes, we can. <laughs> and last one, did you test the phrases that you used in that new definition with the slides with personalized learning and competency-based? Did you test that? If you're referencing to the slides that I just put back up on the screen, no. So a lot of this, uh, were made, I made changes from our original. This is the new one based on our results. And again, based on the results we've seen from other studies. That flexibility and pace is honestly, and you know, Chris, you touched on it early on about that self-paced idea. That's probably the one, I'll be honest with you all, I'm still wrestling with. We have a um, conversation going on in the chat room around the phrase self-directed. I had read something that Matt Shea from RSU2 had written the other day of um, when, when kids have, when you're helping kids build the habits of success and the building blocks of learning, then kids are actually self-directed learners. But without those habits, then they're self-paced. And it's an interesting, it's not a communication stretch hook, but it's an interesting distinction between the two. That is interesting. Okay. Um, I think we can move on. All right. We've got lots more to talk about. So we also went back to the original at the beginning of the survey and asked voters, you know, making the case for change in general, which is critical for you at the local level in particular and at the state level of making that case for that change, which is what I alluded to in that op-ed in Maine from that Chamber of Commerce. It's coming back to the original reason of why we're doing it. What are the goals? What are the outcomes? What are the policy goals, again, from that business community perspective, but also as a parent, the, one of the goals you want to message them is we want your students to graduate adequately prepared with the knowledge and skills, you can't use that phrase often enough in my opinion, but also you can talk about them being self-directed and owning their own learning and making their decisions as an outcome of it. But going back to the beginning, we asked some of the generic questions that we've all seen in surveys. Do you think that students say who graduate with a high school diploma and with good enough grades. Now, I will tell you, I strategically inserted that phrase, kind of that compliance issue, to get into college are generally ready to succeed. I have looked at this data for months now. And I've got to tell you, this really just recently jumped out at me. Because to a certain extent, this doesn't surprise any of us, right? So people said most 18%, some 56%. If you think about the negative of that, I mean, in theory, 100% of students with a diploma in good enough grades to get into college should be ready to succeed. So the fact that only 18% even said most is really actually striking when I took a second to dwell on that. But the big question was, do we ask them, do we think you need to, do you think we need to think differently about how school works? That was pretty high. Not too surprising. But this is where it got interesting. Based on results we saw from a focus group that if, um, some friends of ours did, we asked this question. We did a split sample. We asked half of the voters if they thought schools in America were inadequate, and that's why we need to rethink how we educate children, and we asked half of them if, we thought, if they thought they were outdated. And there's a really big difference. And I think this is in really important, because um, as Chris and I have joked, we've all seen the slide decks. We've probably all used the slides with the 18th century classroom and you know iPads superimposed on them. And uh, generally, our results as well, again, as well as the results from some focus groups we've seen that unfortunately have been shared publicly, but 
that's not the uh, that's not the question. If you think about the average household, there's a lot of technology, even if it's just phones. That's not the outdated message isn't what's going to sell. Parents know that the future is uncertain for their kids. They know that it's changing rapidly. They want their students to be adequately prepared with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in that rapidly changing future. So this is where I'm going to bring in some data from our friends at the Alliance for Excellent Education, because one, we just thought it was awesome, and it also fits really um, well with what we found. So they asked parents what their biggest concerns were, and look what number one for parents was, that schools have a one-size-fits-all approach to teaching students. We've also seen from other studies that that one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter terminology resonates really well with the average parent. Nobody wants cookie cutter homes. Everybody knows their kids are different. So that's a really great winning message for parents. But look at number two, knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills. So, and we did not even intentionally test that phrase, um, but it resonated both in theirs and ours. So some of the talking points we would suggest with parents, focus on the future the outcomes you want for kids, how you want them to graduate. It's kind of that profile of a graduate theme, right? What you want the profile of your graduates to look like, that's a winning message. Knowledge and skills, you've heard me say it over and over again. And thinking about, you know, talking about transparency, like one of those five CBE definition points, right? It's that transparency being very public about what knowledge and skills they have and what they're working on. Be proactive and say your goal is to increase interaction with teachers. Don't, don't let them start thinking it's going to result in less and that one size fits all. Great message. This is the slide that always uh, continues to strike me as, as just huge. So think about this from the Alliance for Excellent Education. 70% of teachers think they're using personalized learning and half of parents think it's practiced in their classroom. I'm going to continue to go ahead and go. So think about that when you're thinking about messaging that 70% of your teachers already think they're using it and half their parents think it's practice. So. You know, I often joke, but I'm being kind of serious. And given this, do you really want to go to your first parent teacher meeting and tell them, yeah, we were never really meeting the needs of your kids before? <laughs> of course not. So be careful thinking that they already think that. You know, we could have a whole seminar on the difference between differentiation, individualization, and personalization, but that's not for the average parent or even a school board member or policymaker, right? So if you look at the top teachers' concerns, they're not given the time or support they need to address every student's needs. Too much time on testing. Look at number three again. They're not learning the knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills. And even number four, critical thinking skills. So you, hopefully you're seeing a lot of common themes. So some of the great talking points we would suggest for teachers, it's not a new reform. So really talking about personalized learning as an evolution rather than a revolution, right? So you're building off current work and school initiatives. So one of the pilot schools that we're working with did a really great job of talking to the teachers and saying, we're building off the current system of multi-tiered systems of support. We're building off universal design for learning. We're building off the Marzano teacher evaluation system that we've already got in place. So it's the next logical step, the next evolution in providing them the tools and the flexibility they need to do what they've always wanted to do, which is to meet the needs of their kids, rather than sounding like it's the new reform that's going to go away. And of course, a great talking point for teachers is that by doing this, we're going to make sure that your, your students are truly prepared for the next class grade or semester, and the ones you will receive will be prepared as well. Our friends at Achieve and Nellie may give us some good talking points, too. I would always encourage you, uh, Achieve does these great surveys called Rising to the Challenge, and they look at employers, higher ed, and graduates. And if you look at, not surprisingly, four and five employers report that the graduates are not prepared. So again, adequately prepared with the knowledge and skills is my favorite new phrase. I think the talking point down below from Nellie May is really informative too, especially when you're thinking about policymakers, the broader public. Nobody likes the idea of remediation. 
So that idea that they're not really ready resonates and that that's again focusing on that outcome or that goal of this initiative. So here's a slide that I use a lot to help, especially with policymakers. So that really maybe the problem we're trying to get at is that diplomas and credits based on seat time and sometimes just a barely passing grade has been sending mixed messages and false signals. So Chris, going back to your question of compliance, maybe flipping that message into one of correcting the system of false signals and mixed messages rather than saying everything we've been doing is wrong. So if you look at these talking points, I mean, it's really important to think that 90% of parents think their kids are reading at grade level. But Nate tells us only 34% are. 86% of surveyed community college students think they're ready, but how many of them need remediation? But to me, even more importantly, going back to, again to compliance, 83% of community college students who were A students in high school think they're on track, but yet they're not. So again, not using compliance, but I find, especially with policymakers, a really strong message is fixing those false signals or mixed messages and tying that with remediation uh, resonates. And I get the head shaking. It's kind of like an aha moment of why why this is important. So again, meaningful diplomas, remediation, false signals, knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills. But thinking back to that earlier question about how do we answer that question, the most important message we continue to hear all across the country is it's got to be local, local, local. It's not a big secret that post Common Core, Smarter Balanced Park, anything that sounds state top down or mandated is not a winning message. So here you are, here's the answer. Well, it's not really the answer you're probably looking for, but here's the issue that you all raise is now how do we handle these questions? That's why I say, are you ready? So even if you take all of this data and some of the other studies that are out there and you develop this perfectly fine-tuned one pager, your elevator pitch, you're ready to go, just be ready because you're going to get those questions that you already alluded to. So we ask voters across the country, schools are beginning to adopt personalized learning. Here's the definition. Having just read this, what questions come to your mind? I got over, I think, 500 open-ended responses. Here's a sample of some of them. Now I'll pause for a second, and I'm sure many of you have received these questions or something similar. I wish I could see all your head shaking because I'm pretty sure they probably are because we all get these questions, right? I get them at the state level, you get them at the local level. And so for that reason, our answers are going to be a little different, right? So I'll tell you how I answered that question, but I'm also going to be honest with you. It's not necessarily an answer that a lot of people like. But my answer to that question is it's going to look different from school to school, and that's okay. It should. It should look different. One of our pilot schools has about 10 kids three hours away from any major city, three, 10 kids in the entire district. I can guarantee it's going to look different there than in a downtown high school, right, in an urban area. And that's okay, and it should. And reinforcing that personalized learning and competency-based education supports and enforces local decision-making for curriculum and instruction. Again, that does, the reason I say not everybody likes that answer is because they want that. This is what it's going to look like, that checklist of the five things I have to do or that picture of what it will look like. And I can't give them that. But I think for you all at the local level, hopefully you can be. So you can be prepared for this. And again, it, knowing that this is innovation, right? So it's going to be iterative and you're going to be learning along the way and making adjustments and tweaking. But somehow at the outset, sketching out a little bit of what that transition is going to look like but again, not scaring them too much at the outset, saying, oh yeah, we're going to get rid of traditional grade levels, report cards are going out the window, because that would be a sure way to freak people out, for lack of a more professional term. And uh, I also want to tell you, and I'm really excited, uh, this week we will be releasing our new communications guide. We partnered with Education Elements to put all the data you just saw into something hopefully a little bit more helpful and useful, specifically on how to communicate to families. And here's some more resources for you, and there's plenty more in the internet, but here's some of our favorites as well. And I am ready for some questions, thoughts, concerns. Please give me your anecdotal stories or your experiences as well. 
Um, so, Carla, I actually have a question for the chat room because we had somebody ask a question that isn't related directly to your presentation, but if someone could help answer would be great. And the question was, what are different models or how do you um, have indiv individual pace for learners while still enabling collaboration and group work? And that's just something about practice that came up in the chat room. But for you, Carla, first we have some clarifying questions. Are those, when you were at the statistics um, slide, were those national statistics and where did this um, statistic on perception come from? Sorry, I had to click yes. on my button. I had to go off mute for a second. Yes, these are national, and I can provide all the citations. They're in the footnotes, but I can't see them on the way the slide deck's formulated right now. OK. okay. Um, yeah, if you would send those, give those to me, then I, we can get those sent out to everybody. Sure, but um, I would encourage you also, I'm sorry, Chris, let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. Um, depending whether you're at a state or local level, find some data that resonates at your state. Find your remediation data. Right? And couple that. So couple, find your data to make it local and personal. This is national, but I would absolutely encourage you that to the extent that you can, find the data you need to show the disconnect or the false signals that we're giving students um, based on grades, diplomas and credits and sheet time. Great idea. So um, two pretty specific questions about messaging. Did you ever test the um, phrase knowledge, skills, and dispositions? And what do you think about that phrase? The answer is no. And the question is, I wouldn't because what is a disposition? I mean, I kind of know because I'm knee deep in this work with you guys, but an average voter is not going to really know that. I think it's an inside baseball term, just like we didn't test student voice, choice, or agency because I don't think most people even know what that is. And again, that's why, I, that's why I took time at the beginning that this is really about that elevator pitch. This is not the messaging you may use for that two-day professional development with teachers when you're in, actually in implementation. This is what I would tell a policymaker, that first PTA meeting, that first school board meeting. Yeah, I tested dispositions with the ladies on the beach like five summers ago, and it didn't work at all. Just it was during summer vacation. <laughs> it's just like soccer games too. Didn't work. Um, I got another question, which is um, all kids, each kid. So when we're talking about trying to get the idea across that this is for everybody, do you think there's any difference about how we phrase when we say all kids or each kid? I actually, yes, I do. We didn't test that specifically. Um, and I've got other data that we could talk about if we, if we have a follow-up. But one of the most common myths that's out there, and it's pernicious, is that this isn't for all kids. So that's why I, I do think there's a difference in that. So the answer is yes, but I would really more caution us on how we describe these things so we don't let people think that it's not for all kids. Does that make sense? Helpful. Okay, and here's another one. How do you communicate and bridge the gap between current educator belief, and we are doing this already, and the work and the lift that needs to be done in order for educator belief to match the educator action? So this is if you were talking to teachers. Let me go back to that slide for a second. One, I would remember this. 70% of them think they're already using personalized learning. Again, we can parse definitions and checklists. Well, they're doing this, they're not doing that. I don't think that's the point, right? So I think the most successful message you can use with teachers, I believe in my heart, this isn't tested, but I believe this, teach what teachers want to do. It's why they got into this business. They want to meet the needs of kids. So it's more a positive message about taking this to the next step. You're doing a great job. We, we've, been, we've been working in differentiation now for how many years in our district or our school. We want to take the next step and give you more flexibility in tools to really personalize learning, rather than saying, well, what you're doing hasn't really been enough, right? Or it's really not personalized, it's just differentiated. But really making this a positive message of what they can do and what, what, op what opportunities you're going to present them. 
Great, great. So I think we're done with questions, but if somebody wanted to see, could you go back to the slide of resources so that people could see them and maybe talk people through that? And then I think, unless something else pops up, we're done. And I believe the slide deck's going to be um, available for anybody, right? Yes, the yeah. webinar um, video gets released afterwards. Especially, Actually, I don't know, do we release the slides as well? We can. I know yes, that the slides and the recording will be available. Especially if you're implementing competency or mastery-based education specifically, I would really encourage you to look at that first video, Building a Foundation for Personalized Learning. Chris, you've seen our video that's at two and a half minutes and has CellCon and the house being built and it collapses graphic. I think it's super yeah, it's powerful. Great. We have some really great quotes from Tom Rooney from Lindsay. So that's really my favorite because it's just very visual and really helpful to understand. And then of course, hopefully, I believe in two days you'll be able to get this. And we'll be doing a blog to launch it that I'll send uh, Chris for INA Core and Competency Works as well. Yeah, that's great. Let's go back to that resource slide though and talk people through what those resources are. So sure. the first one that's in purple um, is really for state policymakers. It's from, is that by a cheese? I can't that's remember. That's us. No, that's ours. No, that's you guys. Okay. So um, Carla's team does great work around policy um, and so does Achieve. So that purple one is for state policymakers. And I actually am not familiar with the learning accelerator one. Carla, could you talk about that one at all? Yes. That's the that, second one. That one is really about helping to craft your vision. And the steps you would take, it's kind of a guidebook. It's actually really good. Education Elements and the Learning Accelerator partnered to do that planning. And they have lots of really great examples from other districts as well. I think that was super helpful. Chris, I know you're familiar with the Achieve one that Corey did that has great infographics. Yeah, so great. that one is, uh, has little vignettes yeah. of what would happen to different students. So they give you some stories to work with. Um, and then the competency-based education toolkit, uh, and this is, I, I will say, a bit of a debate in the field. So I'm, uh, they have organized a framework so that there's lots of different entry points into competency-based education, and then drawn out um, snippets and little case studies and some tools from different districts who are doing the work. But they're doing the work in pretty different ways. Um, at Competency Works, we believe that some strategies are probably better. We don't have evidence of this, but that some entry points and strategies are going to be better than others. Primarily, we believe that that, um, that there needs to be a shared commitment from leadership and the school board when you get started, not after. You don't do the pilot first, you do commitment first. We think that makes a huge difference. But if you are a person who believes that every door is going to get you there, um, which may actually be true, that toolkit is really helpful. And then these videos, as Carla said, the first one's by her team, so is the second one, and the third one from KnowledgeWorks that has been putting out some communications tools as well. So, um, and these are primarily communication tools and resources. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see them. And uh, thank you, Carla. There's Carla's information, Carla at excelined.org. It's always hard for me to read that word. And we didn't, um, this, we didn't put the last one. Competency Works is releasing a number of papers over the next two months. Um, tomorrow, we are releasing the final paper on the equity principles from the National Summit. Then the next one is meeting students where they are from the redesign team, that'll be in May. Actually, I might need your help. Then the next one is called Lovers and Logic Models, and it's in a very advanced document for researchers or people who really want to go into the details of what a comprehensive competency-based system looks like. And then following that will be the quality design principles, uh, where we look at 16 design principles and their implications for the choices you make in, um, in creating your competency-based system. So Carla, thank you for your excellent work. I just can't wait to see what you do next. You're really guiding our field 
I'm so appreciative. And thank you all for helping to answer each other's questions. That was really quite extraordinarily wonderful, and I was learning with you. Thank you so and much. Have a good day. Okay, bye bye.